Hello, and welcome to episode 315 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron here in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this morning, or this afternoon, I should say, Bill? How are you doing? <clears throat> I'm doing just fine, Seth, uh, just so you know. Um... We're setting up here today with a different bit of software, so pardon me if I mess things up, but I'll try to do my best. And, uh, and we're kind of doing solo, the two of us, today after doing a series of episodes with John Parshall in, on Saipan, Phil C., and the environs. So it's going to be a little lonely, maybe? I don't know. I think we'll be fine. <laughs> Well, the original dynamic duo can get it done. I, I have, I have no fear. I think so. Uh, no, it's all. It's always fun to have John, but uh, we're the we're the original core. So, so we'll go it alone on this one. This is an interesting topic, Bill, that I think a lot of people don't know about, or if they do know about it, they don't know all about it. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see some of the comments on this particular episode. Um, can I admit something to you? Started. Shoot. I didn't know about it either. So, <laughs> if at some point in my past life I studied this battle, I had long since forgotten it until you said, hey, we probably ought to do this one. And I said, yeah, we ought to, because maybe I'll learn something too. It's, uh, it's not one you talk about often, and there's a multitude of reasons why, and not the least of which is, is it occurs you know, during the ramp up to Operation Forager, but but we'll get mm. we'll get all to that. Um, before we get started, we do want to ask you to like and subscribe to our channel as it helps other people find our show. Please do actually subscribe to our channel. We do appreciate that very, very much. And to those who have, thanks. Um, this week, we are going to pause in our dissection of Operation Forager to take a step back, not too far back, but back, and dive into an invasion that probably, as I said just a minute ago, 90% of the general World War II public has never heard of. You've probably never heard of it for a myriad of reasons, not the least of which is that it occurred shortly before Forager, but was in, in a way an important part of Forager, even though it was never meant to be that way in any way, shape, or form. The island of Biak sits just northwest of the Allied stronghold of Hollandia. Listeners will recall our episode with John McManus where we discussed the Hollandia and, and Itape invasions, both of those landings which were extremely successful despite Japanese counteroffensive that lasted counteroffensives that lasted over six weeks following their capture, were conducted in an effort to both cut off Japanese forces at Wewak and also grab natural anchorages in preparation for the recapture of the Philippines, which was now being targeted for October 1944. After both Hollandia and Itape proved to be unsuitable for use as air base bases, General George Kenney pinpointed the island of Biak as another possible site for an airstrip that would support the future operations in the Philippines. American intelligence, which until recently had been fairly accurate in its predictions of enemy troop concentrations and abilities, told General Douglas MacArthur that BIAC should be a walkover, an easy operation that would be over and done within a week. The Japanese, who had far more troops ashore than Allied intel said they did, felt differently about BIAC being a walkover and a one-week operation. Bill, this is, uh, this is one of those campaigns that that is out in the weeds and it gets lost to history, unfortunately, but this is a serious, serious operation. And one, you know, and we'll talk about this as we go on. You, you, you think in your mind as an American, once things start rolling through 1942 and 43, and especially in a 44, that we do everything right. That everything we do is we got the Midas touch, bam, you know, it tell you everything that we touch turns to gold. Everything's a success. We've learned from our mistakes, blah, blah, blah. But this operation specifically goes against that premise, Bill. Yeah, and, and our viewers do like maps. So let me pull this one up because Biak is this little island here, you know, kind of in this big bay of Papua New Guinea. And so folks are going to understand why is this island so important well, it's because the Japanese had these three airfields. One, two, actually, there's another one in here, three. 
And those airfields had the potential for creating a lot of difficulty for us. So somebody on General MacArthur's staff said, it's really important that um, we manage this island of Biak. And as, as we said, well, I'm going to go back to this map just for a second, because the, um, the point you were making about you know, PNG, about uh, all these other really important places, that's not it. Uh, here we go. Nope, that's not it. Like I said, sorry for this. Uh, that's not it. It's process of elimination here. I must have closed the map. Anyway, <laughs> we are talking about an area that's not all that far from, yeah, sorry, um, from Hollandia and, and these places here. So I'm going back to us. Um, and, you know, just to hop, skip, and a jump. Now, a 600-mile jump along the coast of New Guinea was a serious risk by MacArthur and his crew. By cutting the Japanese off in WeeWAC, it gave Mac a relatively free hand to do what he wanted in the area, which was, of course, build airfields for Kenny and keep pressing towards the Philippines. The ground at both Landia and Itapi, by the way, we had commenters saying, when we called it Itape with um, John McManus, they said, thank you for, for pronouncing it right. And then other commenters who say, it's Itape. I'm flipping a coin and I'm calling it Itape. But the ground of both Hollandia and Itape was found to be unsuitable for airstrips. Stupid us for not doing that before we sent all those resources and lost all those men trying to take that area on PNG. It was a serious intelligent failure on Southwest Pacific area's hands. And once this was recognized by General Kennedy, and he had to have a more suitable place of territory to build a strip to support further operations. And one of those operations was something we've been talking about, Seth. Mm -hmm. he, he needed to he needed to get into the area to to push the further air envelope as it's going towards um, the Philippines. But one of the things that MacArthur had done with or had promised Nimitz in their one on one meeting before Operation Forager commenced was that uh, Max people would provide aerial support for Operation Forager as Operation Forager unfolded. And of course, this is going to be the invasion of Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Um, <clears throat> Hollandia and Itape were thought to be those places. That That's where they're going to be. Uh, we can use these airstrips out here and support Nimitz's operation in the, in the Marianas Islands. But as you just said, Bill, that, that doesn't work out like that. Um, and Kenny, General George Kenny, who's in charge of the Fifth Air Force, he needs to have another place to fulfill one of his desires and needs, frankly, to be honest. The island of Wakti was invaded by the 163rd Regimental Combat Team on May 17, 1944. Wakti also proved to be insufficient for Kenny's heavy bombers and would also prove to be a liability in the early part of June when Japanese aircraft raided the new American airfield and laid absolute waste to the 5th Air Force aircraft station there. Uh, you know, it's you put a, a note in the notes here, Bill, it's, it's rolling the dice, you're fishing for landing uh, strips, or you're fishing for airstrips here. This is a, it's kind of a, I don't know. They're, 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 they're playing with fire here. They're invading places just to get an airstrip when they don't have the intelligence as to whether or not, and, and by intelligence, I'm talking military intelligence, to know whether or not this is going to be a suitable place for an airstrip. Hollandia, Itape, Wakde. These are places that are not proving to be what is needed, yet Biak eventually becomes that, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is recon by invasion. This is not the way you're supposed to do it, right? In the movies, this ain't a movie, by the way, in the movies, you put a small team of scouts ashore. You have them do, you know, recon and things like that. But sometimes you do it by submarine. <laughs> you know, that didn't work um, with a group of raiders that we covered in a previous episode. But the point is, you, you need to know something about the terrain, about the you know, the order of battle, the enemy disposition, 
and all those things before you commit to a large scale invasion, because not only does that consume a lot of resources, it delays action to the extent that it fails. And so it slows the pace of operations. There are a bunch of, so by, by refusing to risk a small unit to conduct actual recon, you risk large units. And I don't know how these folks didn't know this. And, and you know, the thing is, Bill, is that they had a force, they being Southwest Pacific, 6th Army under Kruger, had that force to do that very thing. They created the Alamo Scouts to do that very thing, to go in there and recon locations for suitable landing strips, Japanese troop strength, all this kind of stuff that for whatever reason, Kruger had formed specifically to do that task and failed or neglected to deploy them to do the job they were trained to do. Not just mm -hmm. once, but multiple times. So it's 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 piss poor operation on the side of Walter Kruger, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, spear Kruger here in this episode, and it's completely justified, as you will see soon. Now, looking at a map, Biak Island, which we just talked about, it lays within striking distance of the southern Philippines, the Marianas, the Palaus, and western New Guinea. It, it was a very, very inviting target for the Americans as we're continuing our advance up the coast of New Guinea. The island's size, 45 miles long by 20 miles wide, made it more than big enough to support General George Kinney's B-24s with room to spare. It was an absolutely perfect target and location for Max next jump. George Kinney, however, Bill, was not the first to recognize Biak's usefulness, was he? No, the Japanese didn't have B-24s, but they knew how useful it would be. And they'd been on BIAC since 1942 and established not one, but those three airstrips I showed here earlier. One, two, three. And that's exactly the kind of force that we were looking to establish for our B-24s. So they built these things, the Mokmer, Barokoe, and Cerrito, they've been operating for the Japanese since January 43, and it proved both useful and vital to their area defense and supply, Seth. So, you know, th that begs the question, what were MacArthur's plans at this point where he really needed to start getting his toes in the water, as it were? Well, you know, I mean, the Japanese were completely aware of, of MacArthur's desire to get back to the Philippines. I mean, Christ, everybody on the planet Earth knew about MacArthur's desires to get back to the Philippines. You know, it, it, by hook or by crook, I put it in my notes, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, the Japanese felt that Biak was worthy of defense. And I say this because, as we have noted in several operations, specifically in New Guinea, that there were places like Hollandia and Itape that they did not feel were worthy of defense. Only after we got in there and got established did they feel like they needed to come down there and try and kick us out. Regardless of this, uh, the Japanese felt like they were going to be able to pour defenses into the Biak, in, in the Biak period, and real, honest-to-God defense. And by that, I'm talking about a battle-tested China veteran, 36th Infantry Division's 222nd Infantry Regiment. They were moved to the, co to the area to be the core of a strong defensive network. These aren't, you know, just service troops. These are hardcore bad the bone combat veteran infantrymen that are being put over here, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And following the American invasion of Hollandia, the Japanese headquarters in Tokyo saw Biak as expendable mm -hmm. and was prepared they to give... real quick. What, pardon? I said they shifted their idea real quick, but it, it shifts back. It's interesting here. They shifted their opinion, right. And, you know, they were prepared to give the order to to order the garrison to fight a delaying, self-sacrificial action. Now, what Japanese action during the war wasn't self-sacrificial? Should the Americans strike there next? However, General Anami, who was the second area army commander, felt differently. And this is one of those rare occasions where somebody in Japanese army leadership decided not to obey senior leadership in Tokyo. So he saw Biak as a place from which the Japanese might be able to stop MacArthur's advance. So Anami, who had once been the emperor's aide-de-camp 
which is incredible, saw the potential in Biak's airfields. He was well aware of the Imperial Japanese Navy's ego plan to fight a decisive action with the Americans in the Palau's or the Philippine Sea. And he felt that Biak's three airstrips strips would come in very handy when the Americans showed up in one of those two battle areas, Seth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100 percent. And and had the Japanese been able to retain Biak, it most certainly would have fallen under the umbrella of the battleground, as it were, that the uh, Battle of Philippine Sea that we just covered would fall into. Um, Biak was in a perfect location to interdict any kind of major American naval force that was going to enter into that area. So the Japanese, specifically General Anami, felt that it should indeed be retained. It's not. This is not going to be something that we're going to ask people to fight to the last man and just never give them any support. No, we're really going to defend this place because it's important. And to your point, he fought against the Imperial Army in Tokyo, pushed his agenda, and won which is saying something. Most of the time, those guys, if that happened, which was rare, didn't win. But he well, did. Maybe it, no, the emperor. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that probably helps. <laughs> yeah. It probably helps. By the end of May 1944, Biak's garrison comprised some 12,500 men, a company of Japanese tanks, field artillery, anti-aircraft artillery, combat engineers, as well as Imperial Army aviation ground personnel and roughly 1,500 naval base and guard troops. So this is not some small garrison here, but the key is that infantry, the 222nd Infantry Regiment. Defense of Biak fell to those guys, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, I want to go back to the map here because I want to talk a little bit about terrain. You know, those of you who read Killer Angels and know something about the study of uh, the Civil War, you know, know that terrain, you need to hold the high ground. So all this dark brown here, that's high ground. Okay, so of course, you don't want to invade in a place that where, where the enemy could be holding all of this high ground above you, do you? You'd want to invade in a lowland where you can get kind of penetration deep inland before you have to face an enemy that's dug into mountains and caves and things like that. Keep that thought in mind as we talk about what we're going to actually do here. Because, you know, here, the deal is that it, Biak was perfect for any type of defense. Those high rocky ridges I showed you, coral outcroppings, which would invade with the landing boats, Caves and terraces dominated the terrain, not unlike the inner portion of Saipan, ironically. And we said this already, this happened before Saipan. That's an important point. But if the Japanese had to retreat to these positions, you know, they would make the Americans um, dig him, the Japanese, and their men out of every cave and hole. Now, the 41st Infantry Division, who would be slated to take Biak, said in their unit history, bounded by an almost unbroken ridge of narrow, terraced coral reef, which in places rises to 330 feet on the ocean side and 160 feet on the landward side. The reef is covered with tall rainforests forests, and frequently is made up of parallel ridges which serve as additional obstacles in terrain already quite difficulty difficult so this doesn't sound like it's going to be a pleasant landing seth not at all and the the gentleman who is in charge of the defense we said it's a 222nd but the 222nd's commanding officer is this gentleman named colonel kazumi naoki uh, kazumi was considered to be a very, very intelligent officer with tons of combat experience in China. And he had actually been earmarked for higher command uh, in the near future. Kazumi intended, as had all Japanese, and I do mean all Japanese garrison commanders previous to him, to defeat any invasion at the water's edge. Therefore, all through May, he employed his men in fortifying the southern coast of Biak in anticipation of any invasion that may come. He knew that if the Americans landed, the airfields would be their goal, and as such, he strengthened the areas there. Makes perfect sense. And while Kazumi hoped to defeat the Americans at the shore, 
he knew that if they got ashore, he would have to defend the inner portion of the island. And this goes back to exactly what you're talking about, Bill. The place is built by the good Lord for natural defense. And that's exactly what is going to pop in here. And we're going to get, I'm going to make a point here in a minute as the tactics change for the Japanese. We'll get to that at the end of this episode. But Kazumi established extensive cave networks, and this is key, that would provide more than adequate means of subjecting any American push down the coast road towards the airfields to withering fire from three sides. If the invaders were to somehow reach Mokmer Airdrome, Kazumi would destroy it by directing, he would destroy the airfield by directing heavy artillery fire on it from positions located in caves just above the airstrip. By the beginning of June, Bill, Kazumi and his men were ready for an invasion. Their only problem was that they had no idea when it may occur, if it was to actually occur. Bill, let's yeah. um, let's talk about American intelligence because, or allied intelligence, because this plays a huge role in what goes on here. Or lack thereof, right? So at this exactly. point in the war, um, it's May 1944, the uninformed observer would sit and say that Allied intel should be impervious to any false steps. And while intel had proven to be game changers early in the war, repeatedly, at this stage in 1944, Allied intel in the Southwest Pacific area was anything but solid and concrete. True, Intel had allowed the Hollandia and ITAP Itop, operations to come off nearly perfectly, but it was the Intel failure that allowed the Japanese to break through American lines and force a six-week slugfest at Journey Moore River. We talked about that at some length in that same AOR, and we had all kind of, the, the soldiers had all kind of clever names to you know for the ridges and the valleys and the things where so many of them lost their lives so it was american intel or lack thereof that nearly caused a debacle at los negros and here at biak the intel under the piss poor leadership of colonel charles willoughby also has to come under fire seth yep yeah no doubt i mean you know American intel, and we're not going to go through the whole history of American and Allied intel in the Pacific War, but suffice it to say that 1942 and up to the, about the middle of portion of 1943, while there were gaps in our intel for sure, the intel was good and it was actionable. As you always say, Bill, it's actionable intel. It, you got to be able to do something with the intelligence that you receive. And we did that multiple times. However, after that, there's a lapse. And yes, part of that reason is because the Japanese did change their codes and they, you know, they were kind of getting wise to the fact that we might be reading their mail. But then, as we talked about with John McManus, Australian soldiers, I believe it was the 9th Infantry Division, if I remember correctly, in the Australian Army, recovered the Imperial Japanese Army code books. All of them. In a muddy chest, as I recall. Yes. Yes. And gave them over to Max people who had them decoded and translated and all this other jazz. And we were literally reading the Imperial Japanese Army's mail on a daily basis. And I'm not saying piecing things together. I mean, like reading the damn thing, reading the grocery list. And we knew when somebody was out sick. And yet at this stage, even after this occurs, we see multiple major allied intelligence failures and it has to be pinned on really technically two people but specifically one and that's this gentleman colonel charles willoughby willoughby has come under fire from us before for his lack of interpretation of intelligence or lack of dissemination of intelligence whatever the case may be this is another one of those aspects bill intel can be a killer or it can be a helper and in this case it's it's a bit of a killer yeah, and we don't want to riff off your the point you just made because you said they didn't have to piece them together. Uh, you know, and people think in 1942 we had this great intel coup that allowed us to win the Battle of Midway. It's only partially true. We did have to piece those messages together. We we didn't we weren't able to read everything that was going on. And and the army's complaint, of course, was that they didn't have that kind of intel. That's no longer true in 1944. So, right. you know, are we being unfair to MacArthur and his team here? What else did they have going on at this point that they couldn't get this one thing right before they 
initiated this major invasion? I, honest to God, I can't give you an answer because I don't know. Because, I mean, there really, if you look at the timeline, there isn't anything. You know, Hollandia right. and Itape go, yeah, that's that. And of course, that's your point is that mm-hmm. Hollandia and Itape are there. That's history. That's that's in the yeah. past. And and Wakti is is a walkover. That's done. And then you got this thing staring at you in the face. And again, regardless of this, you have an intelligence team that their sole job is to provide actionable intelligence and accurate intelligence. Mm-hmm. And they're not doing it. operation they're planning for at this point. I'm sure they were distracted by the plans for the Philippines and all these things that are further out. And, and I'm sure MacArthur had them working on all that kind of stuff, too. But you got lies about to go on the line here. And this is the lead lesson, you know, for um, intelligence. And so I remember Desert Storm when Schwarzkopf, his greatest complaint was about the intel, right? He called it, at one point he called it, because I was in the National Military Command Center when this was going on, he called it flip a coin intel. <laughs> I, you, know, you guys don't actually know what's going on. You're just flipping coins. And, and this is kind of like that. And, you know, so it's, it's pretty pathetic. And I'm, I'd like to be a little bit more um, you know, it's easier on these folks, but I, I don't know how to do that because nothing at this point was more important than what we're talking about. Because Allied Intel suggested, for example, that there were no more than 5,000 Japanese on Biak. And the troops that were there were second-class troops at best. Of those 5,000, will it be predicted that only 2,300 of them were combat troops? And one has to ponder, how willing will it be acquired this knowledge? Well, the only way he knew to do it in these days was aerial recon, Seth. And how did that go? Which, which is inexcusable. And we'll get to that in a second. Aerial recon was fine when it came to scouting targets for aerial attack or shipping in harbors or whatever the case may be. But estimating troop strengths through aerial photographs, through, you know, images taken of an island from, you know, I don't know, 10, 12, 15,000 feet should not have been used to inform a major allied operation. And yet this is not only that this is not the first time that this happens. Again, go back to the point where we made Walter Kruger form the Alamo force, Alamo scouts to do this thing, to land on these islands, to, I don't know, scout and inform allied operators about and uh, with actionable intelligence that says, now nah, you shouldn't go over here, you should go over here, or whatever the case may be. And they failed to do that here. They have the force to do mm-hmm. it, and they don't do it. The whole aerial recon thing to determine troop strengths is asinine, simply asinine. It's, and it was no, done no, at Los no, Negros. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's a doctrinal failure. You know, so yeah. the operational commander gets intelligence, and yeah, the intel itself is important, but as important is, okay, how did you get this intel? What method did you use? What were your ways and means? You know, what confidence do you have in this intel? And if you say, look, you could, we got, you know, 5,000 troops, 2,300 of them combat troops. Any operational commander worth his salt's going to ask, how do you know that? And what's the confidence? If you're not asking those questions, it's not only a capability failure, it's a doctrinal failure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and it winds up costing lives here. So based on the aerial images that Kenny's aircraft were taking, Willoughby assumed that just because he couldn't see the troops meant that they were not there. And the assumption of a paltry 2,300 combat troops was based off of the assumption that only half of a Japanese garrison were actually combat troops. I've never heard that in my life, but unfortunately, that is exactly what goes on here. Where the hell that assumption came from is anyone's guess, because as we have seen many times over, that if a Japanese is breathing air, he is going to try and kill an American soldier or Marine or whatever. And the fact that they're not combat troops does not mean that they're any less, you know, effective in terms of defense or offense or whatever the case may be. It does not take much or any combat experience really, or a hardened veteran to sit in a cave and shoot someone, Bill. 
Yeah, I agree with that. You know, unless Saipan hadn't happened yet, maybe, you know, he... So maybe he couldn't have predicted the caves because, you know, the caves really wreaked havoc on Saipan. He should have known that he couldn't see through jungle canopy. So confident yes. in Willoughby's assessment, General Walt Kruger planned to utilize only two United States Army regimental combat teams for the upcoming operation. These RCTs would come from the veteran 41st Infantry Division. Veterans... Of Selandia, Hollandia, I said that wrong, S Sedanda, Hollandia, Itape, Wakdi. The 41st was a hardened battle tested unit of veterans who knew how to fight the Japanese and what to expect. Man for man, these National Guard troops were among the best in the entire U.S. Army, and they would need th that battle skill in the upcoming fight. And I know a lot of our viewers, Seth, keep saying you need to talk more about the importance and impact of the National Guard troops in this war, which we agree with. And this is one of those cases where we're going to be able to do that. Absolutely. And, and these guys were I mean, and we, we've talked about the about the guard before, but yeah. these guys, this this particular unit. These guys have seen a lot of friggin' combat. I mean, you laid it out there. San Ananda, Hollandia, Itape, Wakti, and now this coming up, Biak, and then, of course, later on the Philippines. I mean, these guys see a lot of combat. And at this point in the war, they've been fighting since 42. These guys are about as good as it gets in the U.S. Army. I mean, you could put them up pound for pound against any other division in the Pacific, and they, they, could, they could more than hold their own. They're this invading force from the, the two regimental combat teams from the 41st Infantry Division are going to be commanded by a gentleman named uh, General Horace Fuller. Uh, Horace Fuller was called, uh, he, he was he was an affable guy. He was a he was a kind of commanding general that he had seen the elephant before. Uh, he hadn't seen as much combat as his division had. As he, he had been a, a replacement for another divisional officer who was uh, elevated to a higher post. But he was a likable guy. The men liked him. He liked them. You know, he's one of those commanding generals that had the overall outlook of his men foremost in his mind. Um, he is going to be commanding what is going to be called the Hurricane Task Force is what it is. It's the 162nd and 186th Regimental Combat Team, along with two field artillery battalions. AAA Battalion, as well as a company of tanks from the 603rd Tank Battalion. And while strong, and it is a strong force, Bill, it is too little for the upcoming operation. All told, the invaders would land and fight the Japanese due to the intelligence failure on an almost one-to-one -one ratio, not the five-to-one or six-to-one, as prescribed in any operation aside from this. Again, keep in mind, that the intel said that there were only about 5,000 troops on, on Biak and 2,300 of those troops were combat troops. But in reality, there's over 12,000 people there wearing Japanese uniform and all of them can pull a trigger bill. But even if they're right, you got two regiments, right? There are two infantry regiments and then support combat arms, supporting elements. How many soldiers in those two regiments? Maybe 5,000? Not even, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, my point is that even if they were right, they're fighting with a one-to-one -one ratio. And that, that is just not, again, doctrinally, they're, they're just screwing this up right and left. So on 27th May, 1944, following a 45-minute pre-invasion bombardment, the 186th landed in a mangrove squ swamp due to a strong current, but nevertheless moved inland and secured the supply harbor, as well as the eastern flank of the landings. Shortly after this, the 162nd landed and began their movements towards the airfield. By mid-morning, the artillery had landed and HQ was set, a, set up ashore. Now, before I toss it back to you, Seth, I want to go back to the map because I want to show you all where these landings are taking place. This is the planned invasion route. These are those ridges we talked about. Now, if you're going to red sell this, you're going to war game it. And you have soldiers pretending to be the Japanese. 
even if it's only 5,000, even if it's only 2,500, where are you going to put those 2,500 Japanese as you're landing on this beach? What's your assumption going to be? You're going to put them on these ridges here where those red, uh, you know, markings are that indicate where the Japanese were, Seth. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to assume they're there, that they have All the high ground. And you're, you're going to be coming up. I'm going to go back. I'm sorry about this. But you're going to be coming up. And th there's another map. Let's see. I hope I can find it. It's this one. See those ridges there? You're going to be, you're landing over here. And you're trying to march down this beach between the, the cliffs and the beach to assault these airfields over here. There ain't nothing smart about this assault, Seth. No, no, unfortunately not. Yet, to kind of <laughs> to kind of pro prove it right to a point, to prove Willoughby's assumption right initially, the landings go off without a hitch. Because even though the Japanese had been preparing for an invasion, they, as I said earlier, had no earthly clue when the hell we were coming. And they were, their defenses positions were prepared, but they weren't in them. <laughs> so in yeah. order to defend them. Yeah. Tactical surprise, which is a good thing. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And when we get ashore, I mean, there is, there, there's a few sharp, short fights, but by and large, we pretty much walk ashore on an undefended beach, pretty much. Some 2,000 miles away in Brisbane, Visions MacArthur of receives the report. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. The Guadalcanal, right? You walk ashore, yeah. administrative landing, and then all hell breaks, breaks loose. Go ahead. And that, that's exactly what's going to happen here. Some 2,000 miles away in Brisbane, MacArthur receives the reports of the initial landings and thought that yet again, he achieved a he had achieved a surprise on the Japanese that would result in an easy victory, and to an extent, as I said, he had. The landings were a huge success, caught the Japanese off guard, and while expecting an invasion, the Japanese had no inclination as to when it may commence, and therefore were caught straight up flat footed. In his typical triumphant style, and I know we're going to think you're bashing on MacArthur again. Well, it's warranted Sorry. yet again. Yeah, good Lord. It's like broken records, you know, but it's the truth. In his typical triumphant style, he felt that if the landings went well, then the operation would succeed no matter what. And again, if the landings had gone well, then the operation was primarily over and done with. Where the hell he had came up with that idea again is anybody's guess, because that is not the case. He was so sure that the Biak operation was already finished that he'd issued a public statement on Z-Day, not D-Day, Z-Day, that read, and I quote, our losses, our landing losses were light. The capture of this stronghold will give us command domination of Dutch New Guinea, except for isolated enemy positions. For strategic purposes, this marks the practical end of the New Guinea campaign, unquote. This I is amazing. <laughs> so he, he conflates landing with capture. Two contiguous yes. sentences. Our landing losses were light. The capture of this stronghold, right? And any West Point cadet knows that landing does not equal capture. There were probably a thousand colonels in the army at this point who could have exercised better generalship than MacArthur did in this battle. Kelly Turner may have screwed up at Guadalcanal, but he learned. <laughs> he had the excuse that he was an alcoholic and actually performed admirably later in the war. What's MacArthur's excuse? Yeah, we're beating up on him, but the dude sets himself up time and time again, Seth. Yeah, yeah, and, and this, is, this is, as we're gonna see as this operation unfolds, it just, it goes from bad to worse. However, in truth, on Z-Day, which was the landing day, the fighting was indeed light and the Americans had advanced and captured a fair amount of territory, the 160 seconds. 3rd Battalion had established itself midway between Parai and Mokmer Village, well on the way to its objective at Mokmer Airdrome. The 2nd Battalion held positions around Parai Jetty, just to the east. The 186th Regimental Combat Team had expanded its beachhead around Bosnik and was probing the rough terrain north of the town, meeting very, very limited resistance. The unloading of supplies and equipment at Bosnik was, went exceptionally well, 
And by nightfall, 2,400 tons of bulk cargo, 12 medium tanks, 28 howitzers, and, 28 howitzers, and 500 vehicles had been landing. The following day, a small Japanese air raid hit some of the supply dumps, but the enemy fighters were driven off by Army Air Force's P-47s. More raids would follow, but to little result. Bill, this it, it is going well, but the operation is not over. Just because you put people ashore and you dump a bunch of junk on the beach does not mean that the battle is over on an island that, by the way, is 45 miles long. We did right. not advance 45 miles in one day, Bill. We did not, and so let's track the advance here. The Parai um, jetty is here. The Mokmur village is here. And we're trying to advance towards Mokmur airfield or aerodrome, as I think they labeled it on their maps of the day. So, yeah, on, on May 28th, the mindful of MacArthur's promise to Nimitz to seize the airfields that would support Operation Forager, General Fuller pushed his troops, specifically the 162nd, to ignore the cliffs and ridges surrounding the coast, coastal road. Yeah, good idea that. Ignore the cliffs and ridges surrounding the coastal road and proceed with all haste to the airfield and capture it. The 162nd moved inland in between ridges occupied by Japanese. They made it through Mokmer Village within sight of the airfield when the bottom dropped out, Seth. Mm -hmm. The Japanese, no surprise here, watching from above in those ridges and cliffs that you've been pounding on for the last 20 minutes, Bill, let the third, the third battalion of the 162nd essentially place its head in a noose. They were watching the Americans advance and they were just waiting for the moment to pounce. The narrow coastal road acted like a funnel with no way to turn around without coming under fire. As soon as the 3162nd got into the area in which the Japanese felt like this is the kill zone, they cut loose. Machine gun, mortar, light artillery fire poured into the Americans who quickly realized that the fire was coming from above them on the ridges. Realizing that they had the Americans in a trap, the Japanese launched a counterattack that cut off Lieutenant Colonel Archie Roosevelt, yes, Archie Roosevelt, that would be Teddy's boy, 3rd Battalion. In a frantic radio message, Roosevelt said, quote, they're plastering the hell out of us. One of my three tanks was knocked out by a lucky hit. The other two are out of gas. Send me ammunition, blood plasma, morphine, and water. It is urgent, unquote. Yeah, this is... They you, stuck... They, yeah. No, what I was going to say is Teddy Roosevelt is no stranger to combat. He was in World War I. He got wounded in the knee ended up, you know, having you know, the knee didn't work right. He ended up being medically retired. He went into business. Pearl Harbor happened. He writes a letter to President Roosevelt, you know, um, nephew of his father, or was it his <laughs> cousin, nephew, something like that, right? The new President Roosevelt and says, hey, send me in, boss, send me in, coach. He got recommissioned as a major, and, um, and then he's a lieutenant colonel by this point. And, and so keep that in mind as we talk about him in the future. So this isn't some shrinking violet. He's trying to do his dad proud, Teddy Roosevelt. And so he, his third battalion would be isolated and cut off from its parent unit for two days, subjected to fierce fire from above and no less than three Japanese direct frontal assaults with infantry and armor, the 3rd Battalion suffered heavily. The naval liaison, who was to call in gunfire support, Navy guy, right, was killed mm -hmm. in one of these early Japanese attacks, therefore negating the valuable asset of naval gunfire support because nobody else knew how to call for fire to the ships at sea, Seth. Yeah, at, at least in this little finger of American troops that are pushed out there, they are pretty much stranded. Um, LVTs, landing vehicle tracked, make quick trips to the 3rd Battalion perimeter to drop off supplies and take out critically wounded men. I mean, these guys are caught. They are cut off. They are caught. The only thing that can get to them are LVTs that go out from the American beach around the Japanese perimeter to where the 3rd Battalion is. Mokmer Village was crowded with wounded and dying American soldiers with casualties mounting and no real hope of advance. Roosevelt was ordered to withdraw on the 29th. 
under heavy enemy fire and supported by for fire from two Shermans, as well as air support and divisional artillery that had just recently gotten into action. The survivors either sprinted or were rescued by LVTs from Mokmer Village eastwards out of the noose they had walked into. So this is reminiscent, frankly, Bill, of Buna Gona, when mm -hmm. you know we send infantry into these heavily defended hornet's nests and they have to crawl out under fire. This isn't much different here. No, you know, but General Fuller, realizing that he made a fatal mistake by not clearing the ridges and caves above him before the advance, and again, he'd been pressured to kind of just essentially charge at these airfields, immediately requested reinforcements be brought in, namely the 160th Regimental Combat Team. In only two days of combat, the 162nd had sustained 12% casualties, one out of 10, right? So Fuller also realized that in order to get to the airfields, he had to clear the ridges, because we're talking about these LCTs coming here and ex exfiltrating back to the landing zone here. Well, Fuller also re realizes that in order to clear these airfields, he's going to have to clear these ridges above. He just has to do that. And since you put in your notes, duh, he would have to send a force <laughs> over the ridges, well, east of the Japanese fortified line and move to the west from there. So that was kind of the plan at this point. Does that work? It's not a bad, does it work? In short answer, <laughs> eventually, yes, but right now, no. And it's not a bad plan. I mean, it's frankly, admittedly, is what Fuller should have done to begin with. And, mm -hmm. and you said Fuller is, Fuller is under pressure, and he is. And he's not under pressure from MacArthur directly, be 100% clear. He's under pressure from General Walter Kruger. Walter Kruger is breathing down his neck because Kruger, Kruger has his good points, but he's kind of a jackass, frankly. He's not, he's not my favorite person. He's not my favorite Army general in the Pacific at all because he's a bit of a, a pedant, you know, in, in my opinion. And, and he doesn't get the grasp of the situation often. And we're going to see that here in a minute. After the 163rd arrives on the scene, the 186th, so this is the 163rd, is the regimental combat team that um, that Fuller requests to be put in. It's another, it's the other part of the 41st Infantry Division. Uh, this frees the 186th to move towards the ridges or rather around them. Uh, in the June heat, however, the infantryman's strength is quickly sapped and water supply quickly became an issue. Remember all those supplies we were talking about that, that we had piled up on the beach and I went through the whole list a minute ago? In a mm -hmm. situation all too similar to Hollandia, supplies for the infantry had to be hand carried from Bosnick Harbor all the way to the infantry advancing through the jungle. So needless to say, Bill, the advance of the infantry, because of the lack of water, the lack of supplies, and, and I shouldn't say lack thereof, it's just the slow pace of the return of the supplies, the, the pace of the American advance was incredibly slow, incredibly slow. Yeah. All right. And so Kruger's not happy about that, right? So not at all. The fact that the BIAC operation as yet had not been decided, Kruger, in a lack of touch, is going to sound... What we, what we accused General um, uh, Smith, and talking about Holland Smith in Saipan, say, lack of touch, he sends some of his staff to Biak to see what's going on. He doesn't go, he sends his staff. Once there, the observers noted that the recon being conducted by the infantry was so poor that the men did not know where the Japanese were lo located. Uh, recon and force, it's called, right? They weren't doing that. And that so few of Fuller's staff had visited the front lines that it was impossible for them to have obtained a complete and accurate picture concerning the fighting, where it was, and stuff like that. So that was the report that Kruger got back, Seth. But you don't agree that that report was fair, do you? I don't. I don't. And I... And I in our notes, I put, uh, you know, I have an issue with this. So while Kruger had every reason to be upset, and he did to a point, the fact that the 41st had run into stiff resistance should not, at least at this point, be placed on Fuller alone. The absolute abject failure of the Allied intelligence to gain the accurate or even close to accurate Japanese headcount on this island 
is what's to blame here. It's not Horace Fuller. I mean, admittedly, when he sent the hundred and uh, when he sent Roosevelt's boys into the news, yes, that is Horace Fuller's problem. That is his fault. He screwed up without a doubt. But the fact that they're running into fierce resistance should not be blamed on Fuller here. This is not his fault that that the Allied intel screwed the pooch on this, and that it's literally almost a one to one ratio between American soldiers and Japanese defenders here. That's not anybody's fault, but Willoughby and Kenny and all the other generals who are in charge of allied intelligence at this point in the Southwest Pacific area. But MacArthur's making things better, isn't he? No, no, he's not not at all. (laughs) So he's still in Brisbane telling the press that Biak was in a mop stage, mop up stage of the operation at this point. He was absolutely oblivious, or at least he sounded like he was. Is it that he was ignorant of the truth uh, and that he was, you know, basically regaling the press with his own personal glory of victory? Or did he know the truth and he was flat out lying to them? What do you think, Seth? He, he was lying straight up because <laughs> on, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no doubt. He was just being a headline grabbing tool what? because it, yeah, because he knew exactly what was going on in Biak. He's sitting there telling the press that, yeah, we're in a mop up stage. This operation's going off, you know, great horse crap. He knew exactly what was going on because on June 5th, he sent a message to, to Walter Kruger that said, and I quote, I am being concerned. I am becoming concerned at the failure to secure the BIAC airfield. The longer this is delayed, the longer our position there will be exposed to enemy air attack with possibility of heavy losses therefrom. Is the advance being pushed with sufficient determination? Unquote. This is on June 5th, the day that he's telling the press that we're in a mop up operation. So he knew exactly what was going on on BIAC and that he glosses over. I'm not saying that Mac needed to turn around and say, yeah, we're getting, you know, we're getting our butts handed to us over here on Biak. He didn't need to say that, but he also didn't need to be trying to get his friggin' picture in the paper when he's got troops that are clearly in desperate need of some sort of intervention. Right. You've got troops in contact. They're being killed. He knows yeah. it's not going well. You just don't say anything. You don't have to give the enemy intel. Just don't say anything. But that's not in MacArthur's nature. So the 186th have been able to advance a grand total, let this settle on you, a grand total of 3,500 yards, 3,500 yards on June 3rd, against only occasional sniper fire. But owing to thick growth that reached 12 feet high, we're talking about you know, vegetation, the troops' visibility was limited to about 10 yards. The 186th spent several days re- reconnoitering the trails leading over the ridges towards Mokmer Airdrome, Airfield. So they, they get where they're trying to go, but they can't see anything because the, the vegetation is so high. So Fuller, by this time, is under ever greater pressure from Kruger to capture Mokmer. And I'm going to show this map to kind of show what's going on here. So they're going up the ridge and around, and he's trying to get to the point where he can capture Mokmer. Okay, so, you know, uh, and Drome, as soon as possible, he orders Colonel Oliver P. Newman, commanding the 186th, to send his troops directly over the ridges and onto the airfield from the north. Despite the fact that this move would expose Newman's men to enfilading fire from the Japanese who still held positions along these ridges. So the Japanese are here, here, and he's being told to climb down these cliffs with these guys firing that way at him. This is just, again, not smart. Um, you know, and so I think, what did he say? We're going to catch hell, Newman remarked, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's exactly what he said. Newman remarked, and I have it in the notes here in quotes, we are going to hatch, catch hell, unquote. And he objected to Fuller's order and was supported in his objection 
by Fuller's Assistant Division Commander Brigadier General Jens, Jens Doe. Uh, Fuller overruled the objections, and the 186 crossed the ridges and occupied the airfield on June 7th. Now, hold on before we go any further. I just want to say, think about this for a second. Now, I went back and, and I defended Fuller just a minute ago because I said, you know, he shouldn't be at fault for running into stiffer resistance than the, our allied intelligence predicted, and he shouldn't. This is his screw up. Big time. He's already put his people in a noose one time that gets Roosevelt cut off for two days. And now this section here under Newman, he knows the Japanese are in these ridges. These are the same Japanese, or at the very least, it's their friends, who poured all that fire into Roosevelt's people. He knows that we have not taken these ridges yet, and yet he still wants to send American infantry under the watchful eyes of the Japanese on those ridges to go take an airfield. That, by the way, when and if we take that airfield, and we haven't cleared those ridges, who do you think is going to be shooting at everything on that airfield? The Japanese. I mean, this is just absolute flat out stupidity. And Fuller is, is operating under intense pressure from Kruger here, but he's also not being smart. For someone who loves his men, for someone who is revered by his men, he's doing some really stupid things in terms of risking his men's lives unnecessarily here, Bill. So while I went to his defense earlier, I'm crucifying him now because he he just he's screwing up over and over and over again. And it should be no surprise that indeed Kazume's men poured before counter battery fire finally silenced many of the Japanese guns as these guys are moving onto the airfield. This is just it's foolishness, Bill. It is, yeah. So Kazumi, you know, had his headquarters plus one battalion of the 222nd Regiment north of this other airfield here. Um, it is, it's, it's, I'm reading it, Boakoe. I'm really screwing up these names today, Seth. Anyway, <laughs> so that's where the headquarters is in what was called the East Cave Sector over by Mokmar. It was held by elements of two battalions and service units. In the very strongly held West Cave sector, also known as the Sumps, Kazumi had most of one battalion plus airfield construction units, other service troops, and naval troops, what we like, some people like to call Japanese Marines. At Mokmar Aerodrome, Kazumi, Kazumi's hand was forced on June 9th by Lieutenant General Takazo Numata, who was the chief of staff of the 2nd Area Army, who was trapped on Biak during an inspection visit May 27th. Didn't intend to be here, but he's here, and was therefore the ranking Japanese officer on the island. Despite generally leaving operational matters to Kazume, Numata insisted on using all available units to retake the airfield and he assumed personal command of the troops in the West Cave sector, which is uh, slightly unusual uh, for a chief of staff, who generally yeah. doesn't normally have operational command, to do something like this, Seth. Yeah. Well, I mean, he can see, you know, what's happening here. And, I mean, it's not necessarily that he's afraid that the Americans are going to, you know, retain control of that airfield. It's that he sees an opportunity to wipe the Americans out on that airfield. It's not necessarily, oh, they're going to take the airfield. It's like, no, we're going to wipe them out while they're sitting on that airfield because they're under direct observation of our people on the ridges. So no surprise here again. Just before dawn, uh, the Japanese on, on June the 2nd, Japanese 2nd Battalion of the 20, 222nd did that very thing. They launch an attack across the airfield into the American teeth, uh, uh, the teeth of the defenses and a furious Head-on assault, the Japanese punched through American lines and advanced halfway across the airfield before they were stopped. They never even did this on Guadalcanal. A company of Japanese naval infantry advanced clear across the airfield, reaching the American rear area, but had to withdraw due to American fire. The attack to recapture the airfield failed, 
but the Japanese still held the high ground all around it. So in this one attack bill, they, they launch an, they, they launch an attack that actually meets more success than any attack on any kind of airfield on Guadalcanal did. It goes halfway across and some spots goes all the way across, but mm -hmm. this just goes to show you that the Japanese were significantly stronger in this area than anybody had anticipated. And they are more than more than certainly full of fight. Uh, the yeah. Japanese on the ridges are, are still continuing to give us problems, though. Yeah, they're pounding the airfield with mortars, machine gun fire, artillery fire, leaving those unfortunate GI sleepless nights and harrowing days. While the Japanese positions were often in caves in the ridges, making them almost impervious to fire, a great many were not so well hidden. When they fired at hapless Americans on the airfield, their muzzle flashes gave them their positions away at night, allowing them to be pounded by American artillery or supporting naval gunfire. So we got more um, naval gunfire liaison officers ashore to direct that. Particularly helpful with the 41st Division's 105 millimeter howitzers. Every day, almost from sunup to sundown, the 105s poured fire into the ridges above the airfield and within a few days had destroyed over 60 percent of the japanese artillery in the ridges so despite japanese fire still harassing the airfield fuller decided to send in the engineers to make the airfield ready for aircraft now he's sending them in under fire which is odd odd that's a <laughs> That's a slight way to put it, isn't it? An airfield under hurts. artillery fire will never be useful because as the graders and bulldozers are crossing, crossing down the runway, smoothing it out, artillery fire is following them, if not landing on them, making the craters again, Seth. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely... You got to wonder what the hell is going on in this man's head because now he's gotten two of his units... In, in deep to, to keep it mm -hmm. PG. And, you know, he's already gotten Roosevelt's people cut off for two days by neglecting to clear the ridges over to his left and his sides and his other side. And then on this point, he's got an airfield that, yeah, it's in American hands, but it's under constant Japanese artillery and rifle fire. So therefore, nobody can do anything without walking across the airfield and getting shot at. Much less are you going to land airplanes there and have them I don't know, operate at all when they're under artillery, mortar, machine gun fire, whatever the case may be. So you know what? I'm not going to clear those ridges. I'm going to send the engineers in to fix up the airfield that's still under fire. <laughs> it's it's absolutely, under fire. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's stupid. stupid. Those dog face engineers saying, only a stupid officer would give a stupid order like that that risks, you know, you know, us soldiers' lives. It's just, you know, that's the kind of stupid decision that causes folks to say th you know, soldiers to say and the enlisted man soldiers sailor airman marine to say things like this and they were right yeah. in this case yep. they were right so they stopped trying to grade the runway and they wouldn't resume resume work on the airfield until june the 20th so now kruger under pressure from macarthur continually pushes ferner fuller to keep progress moving kruger unaware of the situation because he never visited the battle zone as yet, Holland Smith's cousin, had no idea <laughs> what was going on on VIAC. And so all he wanted to do, all he wanted was forward progress without personally identifying any of the obstacles that are preventing that forward progress. So Fuller advises Kruger that to date, June 9th now, Hurricane Task Force had suffered in excess of 1,100 casualties. Uncaring, Kruger pushed harder on Fuller, who at this time was reaching his wit's end. Mack continually pushes Kruger. Kruger pushes Fuller. And Kruger says, the situation on Biak is unsatisfactory until Kruger considers making a command change. It was nearly at the same time that Fuller requested and received more infantry help in the form of the 24th IDs, 34th Infantry Regiment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Aware of the growing crisis on Biak, General Robert Eichelberger, who is one of my very favorite United States Army commanders 
ever, uh, had been monitoring messages to and from the embattled island. So Eichelberger, who has been cooling his heels since Buna Gona, is kind of, well, I, I say that. He, he was cooling his heels since Buna Gona, and then he gets command of the Hollandia and, and Itape operation. So he's sitting in Hollandia, basically just monitoring the operations as, as Biak unfolds. He's fully aware that it is a mess, shall we say. It, it is a mess. He had a feeling that he was about to be called in to take command of the operation. Nobody had said anything. He's just like, you know what? This is the kind of situation where they send in people like me. I got a feeling I'm going to get a call. He has his staff start working on operational plans before he ever even gets a phone call. On June 14th, he receives a call to report to Kruger's headquarters. He already knew it was coming, Bill. Yeah, he did. I'm just wondering, did he go and and have a conversation with the press? (laughs) No, No, he did not. (laughs) That's that's what got him fired the last time because he took the... Uh, spotlight off of MacArthur. All right, so Bob Eichelberger was not surprised, as you said. So he envisions, Kruger envisioned that Eichelberger would now hold the top command at Biak, but further would continue to serve as the 41st Division Commander. Fuller, however, had had enough and demanded that he be relieved from all his responsibilities and be transferred out of MacArthur's theater. He vowed never to serve under Kruger in any capacity again. Upset over Kruger's aggressive questioning of his intentions during nearly three weeks, three weeks, we're at the point now, three weeks of operations on Biak. MacArthur granted Fuller's Fuller's request and was probably happy to do so at this point. And the relieved Hurricane Task Force commander ended the war as deputy chief of staff in Admiral Mountbatten's Southeast Asia Command. So now, um, you know, the funny thing from my point of view is I'm surprised Eichelberger didn't ask for the same thing a year earlier, wherever, after Bunagona, right? So, um, but he didn't. He's still here and he has the opportunity to be the hero. Now, again, Fuller can blame Kruger as much as he wants. And and there's elements of this that are indeed Kruger's fault. fault. For sure. But there are elements that are not. And they're f- either Fuller made stupid decisions or Fuller failed to push back when pushing back might have actually done some good. And so, yeah, it, his leaving theater and handing it off, uh, handing command over to Eichelberger was a good thing, Seth. Absolutely. And Eichelberger arrives on June the 15th. It was quoted that he arrived in a foul mood, unquote. Accordingly, foul mood or not, Eichelberger did what Eichelberger did, which was to take command, assess the situation, and then figure out rationally what to do and kick some ass. And that's exactly what he does. As he began to sort out the situation, he realized that a short suspension of offensive operations was necessary to locate the enemy's positions with accuracy. Duh. This is something that should have been done from day one. He undertook a dangerous personal reconnaissance of the front lines and according to the man himself, quote, ordered a day of rest and reorganization, June 18th, so everybody could find out what they were doing. I then placed one battalion on the Japanese left rear and two battalions to cut across their rear from the right. This attack took place on Monday, June 19th, and it broke their backs, unquote. Kruger, for his part, is still oblivious and acting like a complete jackass immediately as i mean literally within 12 hours of eichelberger arriving on scene on biak jumps on eichelberger's back demanding that he not give any rest to the gis and attack immediately if you haven't guessed it i don't think very highly of walter kruger frankly bill (laughs) Uh, eichelberger and and neither did eichelberger eichelberger Mm -hmm. absolutely detested kruger viciously he pins a note back to Kruger that reads, quote, having arrived here 48 hours ago in almost complete ignorance of the situation, I have spent two days at the front. I have called off all fighting and troops will be reorganized. On Monday, I will take the two airfields, unquote. In other words, leave me the hell alone and let me do my job. It's good. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could say what you want about Eichelberger, and you, you already said that he's your favorite guy in theater. Um, 
And, and I'll assume you mean Southwest Pacific area. But anyway, yes. maybe it's all yes. Pacific for all I know. No, um, no. no. Yeah. He's, he's doing, he's a general. And he's acting like a general. He's going to, he came up with a plan. He reconned to validate enemy disposition, made adjustments to the plan, and is now going to execute the plan. Boy, uh, boy, oh boy, why don't they teach that stuff at West Point? I think they probably do. So Eichelberger's plan was to strangle the Japanese as opposed to hitting them in the face. He knew the ridges were a tough nut to crack and felt that working around them was the only way to get the job done. Accordingly, he assigned the newly arrived 34th Infantry Regiment to the task of seizing the airfields while all three regiments of the 41st worked around the airfields and cleared the Japanese from the ridges. Keep the Japanese busy so that they're too busy trying to survive to stop the you know, seizure of the airfield. This would sever Japanese supply lines while placing GIs in their rear areas, allowing the Americans to wipe them out systematically and methodically. This is what should have been done from the beginning. So the attack went off splendidly with the infantry seizing both airfields in the 41st, clearing most of the ridges, killing what they could and sending the survivors running into the jungle. Eichelberger admitted later that the arrival of the 34th was key to the success. Seth? Yep. Yeah, the arrival of on Biak of the 34th Infantry Regiment's uh, Regimental Combat Team from the 24th Division enabled Eichelberger to execute Fuller's plan of seizing Baroque Barocco, I, I can't pronounce it either, Bill. So you're not the Lone Ranger. And, and Cerrito Air Drums. Up this time, not me, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Cerrito Air Drums west of Mokmer. Uh, Eichelberger's operations officer. And here's an idea. Here's an idea. You ready for this one? Eichelberger's operations officers repeatedly flew over the Japanese positions at low altitude in unarmed observation planes to locate the enemy's caves entrances. The caves proved too deep for the effective use of flamethrowers, so Eichelberger's men placed dynamite charges in them to kill the occupants with concussion or seal the caves up. This is what a leader does, though, Bill. He assesses the situation, figures out the best way to crack that nut, mm -hmm. and gets it done. You know, it, Fuller was ramming his head into a stone wall over and over and over again, or as I said before and say again, sticking his head in a friggin' noose without looking around to see if there's a rope around his damn neck. And Eichelberger's like, Hey, you know what we're going to do this airfield. We just took, we're going to fly an airplane off of it. We're going to go see if we can find these suckers from the air. And it mm -hmm. works. It's unbelievable <laughs> what ingenuity can do, Bill. Well, particularly since the West cave position had become the linchpin of Biox defense, especially since Kazume had by now moved his headquarters there from the Bosnak sector. So again, I'm going to go back down to this map. Um, so that what we're talking about here is, is the area in here, right? So here's the three airfields, and it's the area in here where, we're, where you know, uh, the headquarters is now, the caves are there. And with the, with the end near, Kazume burned the 222nd Regiment's colors in a ceremony in the caves on the night of June 21st. He was later killed in action. Rations and water were exhausted, so the West, West Caves were finally abandoned on June 22nd. Five days later, American troops entered the cave complex and discovered a chamber of horrors. Listen to this. Full of decomposed and fried bodies, or their various components, and even a butcher's shop for cannibalistic feeding. So you cut the bodies up for food. Boy, oh boy, Seth, we've heard a lot of crazy things on, on Guadalcanal for the starving Japanese. But I think it's the first time we've talked about a cannibalism butcher table. Yeah, I mean, directly, yes. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if you look at some of the accounts from surviving Japanese and from some of the GIs and Aussies who wind up, you know, finding these back uh, rear area positions all through the New Guinea campaign, there are instances or references to Japanese cannibalism. 
which, you know, it's a known thing. We've talked about this bill a gazillion times that the Japanese supply situation on these islands was horrible. It was terrible. Horrible. Essentially, once they were there, they didn't get any kind of support from anybody. And there's a few instances where they do, but by and large, they don't. And they, one of the things that the Japanese run out of first is food. And, and they, you know, we've talked about them subsisting on, you know, plants and lizards and bugs and snakes and God knows what else. Eventually, if you're hungry enough, I'm not saying that I would do it personally by any means, but I mean, again, eventually, if you're hungry enough, you're going to eat whatever you need to eat. And, and this is, happens with sickening consistency with the Japanese in the New Guinea AOR. It, this is not the first time. And I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think it's the last time either, Bill. Yeah. And I remember the story decades ago about that uh, soccer team, Bolivian soccer team, that crashed in the Andes Mountains, South America, and ended up resorting to cannibalism before they were rescued. So, you know, they're, the Japanese aren't the only people desperate to no. put in a de desperate situation to do this. But yeah, I'm with you, Seth. I don't know if I could do it. So with the reduction of these cave positions above Mokma Aerodrome, the airstrip finally became usable and P-40s and P-24s began operating from Mokma on June 22nd. The 34th Regimental Combat Team took Borokoe, I think that's right, and Sorido <laughs> without difficulty. But all of this was too late for MacArthur to meet his obligation to Nimitz of supporting the Marianas operation from the fields on Biak. Fortunately, such support didn't prove necessary <laughs> because the army, in this case, couldn't get it done. So on June 25th, yeah. Eichel Berker notified Kruger that his mission on Biak was accomplished. The plan successfully executed by Eichel Berger didn't differ greatly from Fuller's. But Eichel Berger's forceful combat leadership and solution adjustment to the validated Japanese disposition in an order of battle were able to overcome the operational difficulties on the island and proved decisive, Seth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. And, you know, talk about Eichel Berger being my favorite. He's my favorite U.S. Army commander in the Pacific and probably in World War II because he, he's this guy. He's a he's a genuine person. Uh, you know, he he. We talked about it with John McManus. You know, he's absolutely completely yeah. in love with his wife. He's just, he's a good dude. He's a really good guy. And he, he too cares about the, 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 the welfare of his men. And, you know, he, he learns though. And that's the key is that he learns. He goes into Bunagona and he's got this battle plan and he goes in there. He relieves one of his personal friends and, and he says, I'm going to implement my plan without checking things out. And he runs headlong into a brick wall and he gets his butt handed to him. And then he turns around and he learns from that. And he institutes new ways, different ways of doing things and getting the job done. And he succeeds continually over and over again. And this is no different here. Quite the, you know, it, it's exactly the same. He's relieving a guy that was a West Point classmate of his, Fuller, and takes over this operation and sees it to success. Fuller, for his part, as Eichelberger said, he said he was worn out. He needed to be replaced. Uh, Eichelberger noted, quote, under Fuller, the way we had been fighting the Japanese would have ended in a victory for them or the fight would not have been over until next Christmas. They, the Americans, were using little nibbling attacks that would not have gotten any place, unquote. Eichelberger goes in there, assesses the situation after two days of rest and unleashes the dogs. And then no surprise here. Even though we're on a one-to-one -one ratio, overwhelming American firepower and maneuverability winds up getting us the victory. Resistance in the East Cave sector and in the Ibdi pocket between Bosnik and Mokmer continued for some time after the fall of the West Caves. But by the beginning of July, the battle had actually, not according to MacArthur, entered the mopping up stage, Bill. Yeah, a little bit after MacArthur said it was, but anyway... We've yeah, made that point. Just a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. So the final tally, American casualties through the end of August on Biak totaled 530 KIA, 2,570 wounded, and 54 missing, likely killed. 
Over 6,000 GIs had become tropical disease casualties, 6,000. The exact figures, the exact Japanese figures, as usual, are hard to pin down. Estimates say that 4,970 Japanese were killed. There's another close to 10 to 1 ratio. And only 319 had been taken prisoner. So the fighting on Biak in the caves especially was a portent of things to come in places like Saipan, Peleliu, and Iwo Jima. The Japanese had resorted to holding on to the interior and making the Americans pay for every step of the fighting. Their tactics had changed, Seth. Mm-hmm. And this is something that you're going to see. And this is this is the lesson that comes out of Biak here. And the Japanese, the Imperial Japanese Army headquarters in Tokyo, they are following this operation. They are following what is going on. They understand that eventually, you know, and you said if you did the numbers, Bill, you were talking about, um, you know, uh, what it was the numbers of 4,970 Japanese were killed. Well, we said there were almost 13,000 Japanese on the island. Where the hell did they all go? They all retreated back up into the island's interior. This fight goes on all the way through August. So, mm-hmm. and yes, the Australians do come in here at some point and they, and they take over the fight as, after we pull out and move on towards the Philippines in the beginning of the fall. But this is not something that's just a one and done bing bam operation. This is something that continues to crawl along, but this whole, you know, we're not going to necessarily try and stop the Americans at the water's edge because of the fact that we have yet to do so, even at places like Taro, where they almost stopped us at the water's edge, the Japanese realized pretty quick that that tactic is not going to work. However, if we retreat to the to, to the hinterland and into the inland portion of these islands, especially where we have the terrain advantage with us, i.e. Saipan, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, you know, we can make them pay for every inch of ground with the blood of one or two or more Americans. And, and it becomes a battle of attrition. The Japanese, especially after the fall of Saipan, as we've said before, realize they're not going to win this war, but we can at least maybe negotiate some sort of peace by killing enough Americans where the American public is going to say, eh, we're done. Just get this thing over with and get it over with now, which of course yeah. doesn't happen and leads to us dropping two nuclear weapons on Japan. We, um, we talked in the uh, Mariana's Turkey Shoot episode and the Mission Beyond Darkness episode about how those two missions and the heavy Japanese losses there resulted directly in the creation of kamikaze, which is not a tactic for winning a war. It's a tactic for inflicting no. massive casualties to, to drive people to the negotiating table. Uh, Same thing is happening here. The Japanese are learning both in the maritime, naval domain, and in in ground combat operations because they're changing their tactics to, we're going to go into the interior, we're going to make them, we're going to kill as many Americans as possible before we're all wiped out. Not a tactic to win a war, a tactic to kill a lot of people and bring them to the negotiating table. So again, these... We keep evolving. The Japanese are learning. But this is a lethal logic that they're learning. And it's, it's not going to be end up happy for anybody. No, no. It's Biak is the first uh, example of this, you know, hold up in the interior and make them pay for every inch. It happens again, obviously, in Saipan. And as we said, goes on and on. But it's just a harbinger of things to come as the war inevitably ramps up and violence and and just horror as, as it goes on and biak is one of those places that you know we said earlier is is overshadowed by saipan and and frankly you know you can say rightfully so because saipan operation was so much bigger than biak but biak is an important example of <laughs> number one why you should have accurate intelligence when you go into an operation and B why you should make intelligent decisions with the lives of your men, i.e. the way Fuller did not act and how Eichelberger did act. So, you know, Biak is one of those operations where most people probably haven't heard of it, or if they have, they haven't heard much about it. And I, uh, I, I felt like it was important that we dig into this topic, Bill. Yeah, I agree. And I learned a lot by digging in with you, Seth. 
Yeah. Well, I, I hope everybody work. did too. It, it, admittedly, yeah. it's not an operation that I've studied much about either until we did this. Well, I was, yeah, what I was going to say is you've forgotten more about this operation than I knew going into this. <laughs> well, well, we both learned something. I'll just say that we both learned something. All right. Is there anything else you want to say, Bill, before we close her out? No, I think this does it. All right, cool. Well, with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. We're ready to receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Uh, if you want to see the video version of this, if you're not already watching it, look at our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. If you have a question or a comment, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin. I want to thank you very much for sitting in with us and listening to this relatively unknown topic on the invasion of Biak. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And uh, let us not forget how things should be done. Bill, take us home. See you again next week.